Okay, so we've been talking about stomas in relation uh, to some of the medical management associated with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And I just wanted to make sure that you could see a picture of a normal stoma, what it looks like. Uh, you know, we said it's uh, vibrant reddish pinkish in color. And um, also uh, we said it can um, also look mucousy. And one other thing that's important to remember is that after a patient has a stomal procedure, it is definitely normal for there to be a little bit of bleeding, okay, at the stoma site after this procedure is performed. Now, if there is a lot of bleeding, a large amount of bleeding, you would definitely report that immediately. But a little bit of post-op bleeding after this procedure is totally normal. So just make sure you keep a close assessment on your patient. Here is a picture of a stoma where there is definitely a problem, okay? This is a necrotic stoma. This means it's dead. Okay, so uh, if this is a part of the ileum that was brought up to the surface of the skin, uh, this part of the ileum is now dead. Okay, this is necrosed. It's not going to rejuvenate. It's going to, this person is going to have to have another procedure done, okay, to get rid of this necrotic stoma. So definitely when you see this blackish purplish appearance, uh, you definitely need to take uh, heed to that because uh, this is dead. Here is an example of what we were talking about and of paying very close attention to the peristomal skin um, around the stoma. So you can see the peristomal skin here is starting to, it's excoriated, it's starting to break down. And you can see the skin break down there in the uh, upper uh, left hand uh, kind of diagonal corner there. You can see the skin breaking down right there. So this is something that we have to pay close attention to in our patients and make sure that this does not happen. Uh, here's an example of what we were talking about with a sitz bath. So a uh, sitz bath is very helpful to some patients whenever uh, they're going through different types of procedures uh, in the anal area. This is for discomfort. Some people with their sitz bath will use like Epsom salts and things like that to help soothe excoriation in and around um, the um, anal area. So this is an example of a sitz bath and it can be very comforting for our patients. Now, moving on with our disorders of the intestines, we're going to be talking about appendicitis. <clears throat> now, appendicitis is something that NCLEX loves to ask questions about. So it's very important for us to know uh, lots of important information uh, concerning appendicitis. So first off, let's talk about the appendix. Okay, you have an inset picture there over on the left that shows you where the appendix lies. Um, Actually, the appendix, and I'm sure you learned this in anatomy and physiology, the appendix is about uh, three and a half inches long. It's just this little tube of tissue that extends from the large intestine. Um, it can swell in response to infections, uh, or it can become blocked by things like stool, uh, foreign bodies, or cancer. So <clears throat> that is something just to keep in mind. Uh, also, uh, according to my research, um, uh, th they used to think that the appendix had absolutely no function for the body. It was just something that hung there and it, it could cause trouble in our patients. But they're actually finding out through a study at Duke University that the appendix actually has some functions. Um, the theory is that it has some immune uh, properties, so it helps with our immune system, and that it also serves as a, res uh, a reserve for good bacteria. And again, this is uh, from a study that Duke University did a couple of years ago. <clears throat> so appendicitis, what is appendicitis? Well, it's inflammation of the, what your book calls the veriform appendix. What veriform, uh, excuse me, what vermiform means is worm-like, okay? Because it actually does kind of look like a worm hanging down there. So vermiform just means worm-like. So again, appendicitis, we have inflammation of the appendix. The thing with the inflammation of the appendix that we worry about is that it can actually perforate. Okay, so it can develop a hole in it. And everything that is in that intestines and in that appendix area is going to spill out into the abdominal cavity, which can lead to peritonitis. So in an inflammation of that peritoneum, that inner lining that cases our abdominal cavity. So we're gonna talk more about peritonitis here in a little bit. So the lumen of the appendix uh, can become obstructed. Uh, then you have the uh, multiplication of E. coli, and then you have the development of an infection, and you can have pus formation that occurs. 
Uh, the obstruction, again, is usually due to uh, feces, tumors can cause it, things like that. So peritonitis, again, uh, we said can be an end result if we have perforation that occurs of the appendix. Uh, again, make sure you remember that peritonitis is just an inflammation of the peritoneum, that membrane that lines the abdominal wall, okay, and it covers some of the organs inside there as well. So appendicitis, um, again, the lumen of the appendix is very tiny, so it's easily obstructed. Um, it proximally, again, uh, connects to the cecum. The cecum, again, is just the beginning of the large intestine. The appendix is located in the right lower quadrant of the abdomen. So if my patient is, is complaining of uh, pain in the right lower quadrant, I have to know what anatomically lies there. So I better make sure that I know the appendix is where that is located, is in the right lower quadrant. Um, if distension and infection are severe, again, it will rupture. And it's going to release all of the contents out into the abdomen, which is not good. Okay, so what are my very, 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 very important clinical manifestations? Okay, one thing we're going to talk about is rebound tenderness. Okay, rebound tenderness over the right lower quadrant of the abdomen. That is referred to as McBurney's point. And you have a, an inset picture here on the right side that you can look at, and it shows you the proximity of where McBurney's point is located. So you kind of just draw an imaginary line from the umbilicus to that anterior iliac crest, and right around kind of midway is where a McBurney's point is located. Okay, so rebound tenderness uh, at McBurney's point. So what does that mean? Well, rebound tenderness means that when I push in, okay, when I palpate an area and when I release my hand, that is when the patient feels the pain. That is what we mean by rebound tenderness. So when I'm palpating an area with my fingers, okay, I'm palpating that area, all right, when I release my hand, that is when the patient feels the pain. That is what uh, rebound tenderness means. Okay, you also have something called Rolfsing's sign that's important. And um, I have a video that you need to make sure that you watch uh, in reference to this. So with Rolfsing's sign, that is where we have increased pain uh, with light pressure of the fingertips on the opposite side. Um, so I would be palpating in the left lower quadrant, the opposite side of where the appendix lies, so I would palpate with my fingers in the left lower quadrant, but the patient is going to feel the pain in the right lower quadrant. Okay, so let's make sure that we understand about Rolfsing's sign, because this has been on NCLEX multiple times. So Rolfsing's sign is just an increase in pain uh, with light pressure, like I take my fingertips, and I'm applying the pressure on the opposite side Okay, not where the appendix is, but the opposite side in the left lower quadrant. When I press with my fingertips lightly, okay, the pain is actually felt in the right lower quadrant where the appendix lies. So that is called Robsing sign. This is some important information that you better make sure that you remember. <clears throat> okay. So the right lower quadrants, uh, you might also notice with your clinical manifestations that the right lower quadrants, the musculature there, it looks very tense. Okay, the patient might be lying on their back or on their side with their knees flexed, and they're doing that to decrease muscle strain on the abdominal wall. So it's offering them comfort and pain relief. Now during my assessment subjectively, my patient can uh, might verbalize to me that they're having constant pain in that right lower quadrant. Uh, specifically at McBurney's point. Again, that's that point between the umbilicus and the right uh, iliac crest. Um, nausea and anorexia are common. Objective data, vomiting. A lot of people with appendicitis vomit, so we have to worry about uh, fluid and electrolyte imbalances with appendicitis. They might have a low-grade fever, okay? Their white blood cell count is going to be elevated, they're suffering from that rebound tenderness that we just talked about. I can see a rigid abdomen. Uh, also decreased or absent bowel sounds. All right, so diagnostic tests. Diagnostic tests. 
uh, they're going to do a WBC, okay? Uh, so a WBC with a diff is what they call it sometimes, a differential. And what that is, is it's looking at all the different percentages of the five types of mature white blood cells that you learned about in A and P. So it's looking at the percentages of the white blood cells, like we're talking about the neutrophils, the basophils, the monocytes, the lymphocytes, and the eosinophils. That's what we're talking about with the C, uh, when we're talking about a white blood cell, or sometimes you'll hear it called a CBC with diff on a differential, okay? They may do a CT, ultrasounds. They might do a urinalysis to rule out maybe if this might not be appendicitis after all. Maybe it's a UTI, and that's why they're having pain. So they might do a urinalysis. Now, white blood cell counts is something that you have to remember because uh, you will see these on NCLEX and you will definitely see them a whole lot more in the third term. So go ahead and learn some of them now. So my white count, uh, anything above uh, 10,000 is usually suspected of, of my patient having an infection of some sort. So I need to remember my parameters for my white blood cells. So parameters for white blood cells is I always say to remember five to 10. So 5,000 to 10,000. The book uh, might say 4,500 to 11,000. All books give different parameters, okay? Don't get stuck on a certain parameter. Just know a general parameter, and you should be able to pick out whether a person has white blood cell counts that are low or WBCs that are high. So a general rule of thumb, I always remember my white count should be five to 10. So that's 5,000 to 10,000. That is a normal parameter for my white blood cell count. Okay, so medical management, my nursing interventions. Uh, appendectomy might be in order here. So removal of the appendix and appendectomy. Antibiotics are administered uh, when perforation is likely. Uh, some of the complications include infections, they can develop abscesses, they can uh, also develop bowel obstructions. <clears throat> now you have a safety alert in your book that is very important. It's in red, and it's in red for a reason, okay? So we're going to go through these. Look at your safety alert on appendicitis. So we're going to, number one here, the first bullet, encourage the patient with abdominal pain to see a healthcare provider and to avoid self-treatment, particularly the use of laxatives and enemas, okay? Uh, the increased peristalsis of laxatives and enemas may cause perforation of the appendix. Hence, this is the reason why they need to get to the doctor if they're having abdominal pain, especially in that right lower quadrant, okay? where the appendix lies. So they do not need to be treating themselves with enemas and, la and laxatives because they can actually cause the appendix to rupture, okay? And all of the contents is gonna spill out into the abdominal cavity. That is not good. <clears throat> okay, so avoid self-treatment. No laxatives, no enemas. Third bullet, until the patient is seen by a healthcare provider, he or she should remain NPO to ensure the stomach is empty in case surgery is needed. Okay, so in case they need to have an appendectomy, they need to remain NPO. All right, here's one that is extremely important that they, they ask all the time about. An ice bag may be applied to the right lower quadrant to decrease the flow of blood to the area and impede the inflammatory process. Okay, what does that say? An ice bag. Never, ever, ever, never do you place heat in the area of the right lower quadrant when we suspect appendicitis. Never. Only ice. No heat. Okay, the next bullet's going to tell you why. Heat is never used because it could cause the appendix to what? Rupture. Surgery usually is performed as soon as a diagnosis is made. Okay? critical to get in there and perform that appendectomy before we have a perforation and spillage of intestinal contents into the abdominal cavity, which is going to cause my patient to possibly, uh, you can die from peritonitis, or it's going to cause them to be uh, gravely ill and in the ICU for quite some time. Okay, so that is your safety alert that you better make sure that you go over and know. Now, my nursing interventions and patient teaching, it's going to kind of recap some of those things we've talked about 
in the safety alert. Okay, so number one, explain diagnostic tests, possible surgical procedures. That decreases my patient's anxiety. Bed rest, NPO, comfort measures only for pain relief. Okay, let's say that one more time. Comfort measures only for pain relief. No, listen to this, no medications. Okay, they cannot have any pain medications because that's going to mask their symptoms. If I run and give them pain medications, are they going to know if they're having rebound tenderness? Are they going to be able to positively, uh, am I going to be able to positively identify a Rolfsing sign if I, go, if I go ahead and load them up on pain meds? No, I am not. So, no pain medications. We do not want to mask their symptoms. Now, replace fluid and electrolytes. Very important. Related to what did we say? Vomiting. Very important. So, the replacement of fluid and electrolytes related to vomiting. Monitor your vital signs. Document every hour related to the threat of per uh, peritonitis from a perforation of the appendix. Administer opioids after the MD has assessed the patient. Again, why? We don't want to mask the symptoms. Ice bags to reduce pain. No heat. No heat is ever applied because that increases the circulation to the appendix and that can result in the rupture of the appendix. No heat. Only ice bags. No enemas. Okay, we said no enemas or laxatives because we don't want the appendix to rupture. That increases peristalsis. Okay, and that can cause the appendix to rupture. Patient teaching related to the reason for IV fluids and gradual advancement of diet from clear liquids to regular with the return of peristalsis. Um, educate your patient on their antibiotics and other medications. If an NG tube or drainage tubes are necessary, educate them on their purposes. Okay, <clears throat> make sure you take a look at your patient problem there. Okay. Recent onset of pain related to inflammation. Make sure you read over that. It's very important. All right, so next we're going to be talking about diverticular disease. And we're going to distinguish between two terms that I hear many people uh, misidentify. And you need to know what these terms mean. They're used incorrectly sometimes. So let's go ahead and get that out of the way. So what is diverticulosis? versus diverticulitis, okay? Diverticulosis is those pouch-like herniations, okay, through the muscular layer of the colon. When you look at this picture uh, on your slide, you can see those pouches, okay? That's what we are talking about. That is what diverticulosis is, those little pouch-like herniations, okay, in the colon, particularly in the sigmoid colon. That is where we tend to see these pouch-like herniations the most is the sigmoid colon. So where would my patient be complaining of pain with diverticulitis? In the left lower quadrant, because that is where the sigmoid colon is. And you know this from anatomy and physiology already, okay? So again, I have to know where anatomically uh, uh, you know, organs are in my abdominal cavity so that when my patient complains of left lower quadrant pain, I start to think, uh-oh, you know, does this patient have diverticulitis? I know that's where the sigmoid colon is, okay? Like when we talked about with the appendix, if my patient's complaining of pain in the, in the right lower quadrant, uh-oh, the appendix lies there, okay? Again, we've got to know anatomically where things are located, okay? So sigmoid colon is where we see a lot of those herniations with diverticulosis. Pain, left, lower, quadrant. Diverticulitis. Diverticulitis is inflammation, okay, of those sacs. So the, those diverticular sacs are inflamed, and that is why we call it diver, diverticulitis. Inflammation is occurring, okay. Diverticulosis just means they have those pouch-like herniations, Diverticulitis means they're inflamed. Now, the incidence of diverticulosis has increased uh, in people uh, 40 and up, and is thought to be related to a deficiency of dietary fiber intake 
and also an increase in uh, carbohydrates in our diet, those refined carbs especially. Also, aging may decrease the colon's strength and its elasticity um, and lead to those outward pouchings. Uh, some other factors they believe uh, the cause it's obesity, smoking, lack of exercise. Now, the penetration of feces through the thin-walled diverticula is going to cause inflammation and abscesses in those little sacs, okay? And with repeated inflammation, the colon's lumen is going to start to narrow, okay? So the tubing of the colon is going to start to narrow, and this can result in obstructions occurring in my patient. Uh, inflammation can lead to perforation, where we have a hole um, that occurs in the sacs, also, abscesses, peritonitis can occur, hemorrhaging can occur, obstructions, okay? Diverticulitis is the most common cause of lower GI hemorrhaging. So diverticulitis is something we have to be very careful with. Now, what are my clinical manifestations, okay? Well, first off, the patient's going to complain of mild to severe pain in what quadrant did we say? The left lower quadrant, because that's where the sigmoid is located. Uh, fever, high white blood cell counts, uh, high sed rate. Remember, our ESR is what we're talking about right there, our erythrocyte sedimentation rate. So that is increased. What did we say that an elevated ESR indicates? Inflammation, okay? So we, we've already talked about that in the other chapters. If this is left untreated, this can result in my patient getting septic, okay, septicemia. My patient now has, uh, uh, what you know, you hear a lot of older adults call it blood poisoning, okay. They have uh, bacteria in their bloodstream now, very dangerous. They can go into septic shock. Uh, we might see the patient become hypotensive. Uh, they have a rapid pulse, and those two things alone should make you think shock. Low blood pressure, high pulse rate, shock, okay? Intestinal obstructions can occur, and that can cause my patient to have nausea, vomiting, and I can see abdominal distension. During my assessment subjectively, patients with diverticulosis may not have any symptoms. Uh, they might experience some constipation, maybe some diarrhea. They might have pain that they complain about, off and on in the left lower quadrant. Uh, increased flatulence, chronic constipation, and sometimes that alternates with diarrhea, anorexia, nausea, things like that. Now, objectively, abdominal distension, I'm going to be able to see that. My vital signs are going to show a low-grade fever, leukocytosis in my lab work, okay, uh, vomiting, uh, bloody stools, abdominal tenderness, uh, at times a palpable abdominal mass. You can feel it, okay, when you palpate. Diagnostic tests, they might do um, ultrasounds, CTs, uh, CBCs, uh, fecal occult blood tests, barium enemas, okay, they might do a barium enema to try to detect narrowing or obstruction. Uh, colonoscopy may be done to rule out polyps and cancer. Um, one thing that is very, very important to remember, okay, this is very important, a patient with acute diverticulitis should not have a barium enema or a colonoscopy because we run the risk of a possible perforation and peritonitis occurring, okay? I'm going to say that again because you better remember it. Any patient who has acute diverticulitis should not have a barium enema or a colonoscopy due to the possibility of perforation and peritonitis, very important. All right, medical management. Uh, with medical management, to prevent diverticular disease, the diet should be high in fiber, like fresh fruits, vegetables. They need to decrease their intakes of fat, red meats. Um, physical activity is important. Losing weight is important uh, to try to avoid that intra-abdominal pressure. Uh, straining, we need to try not to strain. Uh, that's important. Try to uh, ward off bending too much or lifting. Um, things like that are important. With acute diverticulitis, the goal is to allow the colon to rest. It's got to rest uh, and let that inflammation subside. Okay. We need to be on our toes and watching for possible peritonitis. 
Okay, if they start to complain of severe abdominal pain, they're chilling, they have a fever, they might be vomiting. I notice ascites going on, so that swelling in the stomach is occurring. They have uh, oliguria, extreme thirst. That's telling me something about shock, okay, and possible peritonitis. Administer your broad spectrum antibiotics as ordered. Monitor your white blood cell count. Usually bowel rest and antibiotic therapy are uh, effective enough, but sometimes surgery is necessary. Now in elective surgeries, uh, bowel preps, um, using laxatives, enemas, or intestinal lavages like go lightly uh, are administered to cleanse the bowel. Uh, antibiotics may be administered as well. Now with perforation, uh, abscesses, peritonitis, or fistulas, they're going to probably have to have a resection of the bowel and a temporary colostomy may be necessary. Um, now you have different types of colostomies. You have what is called a one stage procedure. Okay, you have a one stage procedure. And what a one stage procedure is, this is where they resect uh, the affected bowel. Okay, so they've taken it out and then they anastomose uh, back together and there's no diverting colostomy. So this person, they're just taking out the problem area and reconnecting the, the non-problem areas and there's no colostomy. Now with a two-stage procedure, uh, the diseased bowel is going to be taken out and this person is going to have a colostomy with the two-stage. One stage, no colostomy. Two-stage, you're getting a colostomy, okay? So you have other types of procedures that your book talks about, uh, and you have pictures of these at the top of the page. Um, we'll look, take a look at these here in just a second as we're talking about them. You can follow along. Um, so one of the procedures uh, is the Hartman's procedure, and you have a picture of that uh, in A. So you have A, B, and C. So A is your Hartman's pouch, okay, and that's the procedure. That's where the descending colon is resected, so they have removed that, and then the proximal end is brought up to the abdominal wall surface, okay? The distal bowel is then sealed off for later anastomosis. So the hope is with the Hartman's pouch that they will anastomose the intestines back together and the person, you know, will not keep um, a colostomy forever. That's the hope. Uh, the double-barreled colostomy there is B. You can see the double-barreled there. Now the double-barreled colostomy is where the bowel is brought up through the abdominal surface. One stoma, you can see it's two stomas there. One stoma is for stool and the other stoma only puts out mucus. Remember the intestines have a lot of mucus because it lubricates and coats the gastric surfaces. All right, so one stoma is for stool, one stoma puts out mucus only. Now, C there, okay, uh, the transverse loop colostomy. Okay, this is where the bowel is held in place with this little plastic uh, butterfly-like uh, bridge thing. And um, that lies between the bowel and the abdomen. It looks like one large stoma, but it actually has two openings. And again, one puts stool out and the other one uh, only mucus comes out of. So those are some different examples of medical management with uh, diverticul diverticulitis um, patients or diverticulosis patients. Uh, let's see here. Now closure, when we think about closure, closure of the temporary colostomy is the goal. Okay. Sometimes it takes anywhere up to three months before they can anastomose the intestines back together and they can have a normal bowel movement. Uh, nursing interventions, patient teaching. Uh, nursing interventions include patient teaching of the disease process, surgery, make sure you assess the nutritional status, reinforce diet, determine the nature of the pain, implement comfort measures, include the family and patient in setting goals, have the family or patient verbalize and demonstrate understanding of ostomy care, do not rush teaching, wait until the patient is pain free, and more receptive to learning. If someone's in a lot of pain, they're not gonna remember anything that you teach them. So we need to wait until their pain is under control before we teach, or there's no learning that takes place. Family members can be taught to help with the care until the patient can assume the self-care. 
Um, and the ultimate goal is we want them to be independent in their self-care of taking care of their colostomy, okay? Uh, home health care referral may be needed, okay? So that's always uh, a possibility. Okay, so you have um, your patient problems there. Make sure that you go over those. Now we're going to be talking about peritonitis. We've been talking so much about peritonitis, now we're going to focus on peritonitis, okay? So with peritonitis, peritonitis is, again, an inflammation of the peritoneum, of the abdomen, okay? So the, the peritoneum is just the membrane that lines the abdominal wall. That's all it is, okay? The membrane that lines the abdominal wall, the peritoneum. So we have inflammation of that. Uh, bacterial contamination in that peritoneal cavity uh, can be a major cause from like fecal matter or chemical irritations, okay? Uh, when bacteria seeps out from a ruptured site, uh, you're going to have that bacterial contamination and you're going to have peritonitis. Some examples uh, are diverticular abscesses and ruptures, acute appendicitis with ruptures. We've talked about both of those. And also a strangulated hernia can lead to this. Now some of the chemical irritants that can bring on peritonitis in our patients include blood, bile, necrotic tissue, if pancreatic enzymes spill out into the peritoneal cavity, okay, uh, ascites from cirrhosis of the liver, uh, that is excellent for a, that is an excellent medium for a bacterial-like environment, okay, so cirrhosis with ascites, and we'll talk more about cirrhosis in depth in the next chapter. Um, people who are on peritoneal dialysis, okay, they're at high risk. Uh, the main thing we worry about with this is sepsis, okay, we worry about sepsis in our patients. So what are my clinical manifestations of peritonitis? Severe abdominal pain. Uh, the patient might lie, they might lay on their back with their knees flexed to help uh, relax those abdominal muscles. Uh, because anytime they move, it is very painful for them. Uh, they may have rebound tenderness. We talked about that. Muscular rigidity, okay, where the mu stomach muscles uh, stiffen when touched. They might have spasms. Uh, they may also have what is called a tympanic abdomen. So uh, it actually kind of like uh, vibrates whenever we kind of like lightly strike the abdomen. It kind of vibrates uh, like a drum. And it is extremely tender to touch, so I don't, uh, you know, I don't uh, mean for you to tap on it like you would a drum, okay, lightly. But that's uh, what we're talking about with a tympanic abdomen. So during my assessment, subjectively, my patient's going to say, you know, I have severe abdominal pain. I've been nauseous. I've been vomiting. Um, peristalsis ceases, okay. Constipation occurs. Uh, chills, weakness, abdominal tenderness. Objectively, a weak and rapid pulse, they get a fever, they have a low blood pressure, uh, leukocytosis, dehydration, and the patient can actually die from this, okay? That's how serious peritonitis is. Now, diagnostic tests, abdominal x-rays, they're going to do a CBC with diff, okay? Remember we talked about they're looking at all the different percentages of the white blood cells, neutrophils, eosinophils, all of those that we've already talked about. Uh, they're going to possibly do what is called a peritoneal aspiration. Okay, so they go in there with a needle and they aspirate the contents in the stomach. And they're looking for things like blood, pus, bacteria, bile, uh, things like that. Ultrasound, CTs, those are some of our diagnostic tests. Now, medical management and my nursing interventions. With medical management, uh, we're going to, of course, repair the cause of the contamination, if it's due to the appendix, they're going to, you know, focus on that. If it's uh, due to uh, one of those pouches with uh, our diverticular patients, uh, that's the problem. They're going to correct that. Um, IV antibiotics, NG tube to prevent GI distension. They'll be on IV fluids uh, with electrolytes. Analgesics will be given, possibly TPN. Early treatment to prevent shock. Okay, from loss of fluids into that peritoneal space. If things are pouring out of the body from the areas where they're supposed to be, our patient's going to develop shock. Okay, so always keep that in mind. 
nursing interventions and my patient teaching, bed rest, semi fowler's position to localize any of that purulent drainage into the lower abdomen and in the pelvic area, administer good oral hygiene to prevent dry mucous membranes and the cracking of lips because dehydration is a big problem, monitor your fluid and electrolyte replacement, encourage deep breathing, uh, measures to reduce anxiety, meticulous surgical asepsis with all wound care, instruct your patient on the importance of ambulation, coughing, deep breathing, incentive spirometer use, leg exercises, and we know why we're doing every bit of that. We're trying to prevent atelectasis, pneumonia, and DVTs in our patient. At discharge, if the patient has a draining wound, teach surgical asepsis with their dressing changes. Make sure you document that you uh, taught them that and they did a successful return demonstration. Encourage a nutritious diet. Instruct the patient not to lift more than 10 pounds until the physician approves otherwise. Uh, also, the importance of follow-up appointments should be stressed. Okay, so peritonitis is uh, something that can be very deadly for our patients. Okay, so next we're gonna be talking about external hernias, external hernias. Okay, first off, let's talk about what is a hernia. A hernia is just a protrusion of a viscous. A viscous is an internal organ, so we're talking about an internal organ. So we, we have the protrusion of a viscous uh, through an abnormal opening or it can be a weakened area, like in, in the wall of a cavity, like in the abdomen. Um, and, and that organ is protruding from an area which it is normally contained. Now you have different uh, types of um, hernias. Most hernias result from a congenital, which means it's present at birth, or an acquired weakness uh, of the abdominal wall. It can also be due to after uh, surgeries can also cause it. You have different types of hernias. We have ventral or incisional hernias. Again, that is due to weakness of the abdominal wall at the site of a previous surgery. Okay, this happens a lot in obese patients. Okay, these type of hernias do, or someone who's had multiple surgeries in the same area, or maybe they have inadequate wound healing. Okay. Uh, an inguinal hernia is related uh, to weakness in the lower abdominal wall, um, and through that opening, uh, the spermatic cord can emerge in men, and also the round ligament can emerge in that area from women. If you remember uh, from a &P, the round ligament in women is just the ligament that supports the uterus. Okay? Uh, we can also have what is called a femoral hernia, and that's due to the uh, lower abdominal wall being weak and that results in tissue bulging in that groin area. Now hernias can be reducible, okay? And through manipulation, they sometimes can be returned back to their normal position, or they can be what they are called irreducible or incarcerated, and they are unable to be returned back to their proper body cavity. Now something we have to think about, let's stop right here, and this is extremely important for you to remember, is the term a strangulated hernia. Okay, a strangulated hernia, if your book does not say this, be sure and write it down. A strangulated hernia is a serious complication related to an occluded blood supply to an internal organ. So an organ has popped up through that weakening, let's say in the abdominal wall, and it cannot uh, go back down to the abdominal cavity from which it came. So it's strangulated there, okay? It can't move, okay? That's gonna cut off the blood supply to whatever viscous has popped up there. So whatever internal organ that is occluded there and cannot pop back down into the abdominal cavity, it's gonna be called a strangulated hernia. And it is a serious complication related to an occluded blood supply of an internal organ, all right? So that is something you've got to make sure you remember. Now when this happens, if that blood flow, let's say for example, it's a part of the intestines, for example, if blood flow and intestinal flow is occluded, that hernia is gonna be strangulated, okay? And immediate surgery is needed. 
Okay? So that's something that we have to really watch with our patients. Now, factors that increase the chances of hernia formation post-surgery includes age, uh, wound infection, obesity, malnutrition, increased abdominal pressure, and then of course abdominal distension. Now, during my assessment, uh, objectively, I'm going to palpate the hernia area. Okay, so the hernia can look uh, one of two different ways. It can be either soft and nodular, um, so it can be soft and nodular, or it can be smooth and fluctuant, which means I can see moving waves. Okay, it's, I can see movement in waves, like the bowel. Now, here's something important to remember. Never, never, ever attempt to push a hernia back into place due to the potential of rupturing of contents. If you rupture the contents of the bowel, we are in bad shape, okay? So do not ever attempt to push a hernia back into place because it can rupture. Um, all right, so going on with some more objective data, uh, we can see a visible protruding mass or a bulge, or maybe it's uh, at the umbilicus, maybe it's in the inguinal area or near an incision site. Uh, if complications like strangulation or incarceration occur, the patient may experience bowel obstructions. They might vomit. I might see abdominal distension, okay? All right, so diagnostic tests. Diagnosis uh, is based on palpation, and they're going to do x-rays. Medical management and nursing interventions. If there is no discomfort, the hernia may be left unrepaired. Okay, unless it becomes strangulated or, or an obstruction occurs. Teach the patient to seek medical care for abdominal pain, distension, changes in bowel habits, uh, an elevation in temperature, nausea and vomiting. If the hernia can be reduced manually, they might uh, use what is called an abdominal binder. Okay, that can be used to prevent hernia protrusion. So that's something that we can think about uh, using and I placed a picture on the slide for you to look at um, with an abdominal binder, so be sure and take a look at that. Um, again, it's just used to prevent the protrusion of the hernia and to hold the abdominal contents in place where it should be. Um, elective surgery is another option where the defect will be closed by uh, suturing the edges of the muscle or they can use a synthetic mesh, okay? So nursing interventions and patient teaching uh, I'm going to observe uh, the hernia's location, the size, uh, tissue perfusion to the area, okay, limiting activity and the type of clothing the patient wears. Um, uh, hernia raffi is something uh, that can be done. This is a surgical hernia repair. Uh, it can be done on an outpatient basis. They use a laparoscopic procedure to do it, and they suture together um, the uh, muscles. Uh, open abdominal Surgery, that's another uh, possibility. This is necessary for strangulated hernias. Uh, prepare this patient for a very lengthy hospitalization with an open abdominal surgery for a hernia. They're going to be on NG suctioning. They're going to have IV antibiotics. They're going to have fluid and electrolyte replacement, um, analgesics, all these different things. Now, post-op, monitor for urinary retention infection uh, at the incision site uh, with an inguinal hernia repair, uh, scrotal edema may occur. So elevate the scrotum on a rolled pad or apply ice uh, to the area, provide support with like a jock strap or briefs. Uh, deep breathing, okay, every two hours, discourage coughing. Uh, teach the patient how to support the incision by splinting. We've already talked about splinting with a pillow or a pad to help with pain. Uh, give your analgesics per orders. Okay, follow-up care includes teaching the patient to limit activities and avoid heavy lifting or straining. With the B, um, they really need to avoid straining with BMs for up to six weeks. They need to immediately report to the physician any erythema or edema at the surgical site or increased pain or drainage. Okay, so that's important to keep in mind as well. Make sure that you look over your patient problems. 
Okay, so moving on to hiatal hernias. Okay, the one thing we have to remember about hiatal hernias um, is the following. A hiatal hernia results from a weakness of the diaphragm. Okay, that's what we are talking about with a hiatal hernia. There is a weakness in the diaphragm. And that's what hi hiatal hernias result from, from a weakness of the diaphragm. So with the patho of a hiatal hernia, you have protrusion of the stomach and other abdominal viscera, but that just means like uh, internal organs when we th think of about, about viscera. Okay, I mispronounced that, excuse me. So you have protrusion of the stomach and other abdominal viscera. That just means internal organs like the intestines, for example. So we have protrusion of the stomach, for example, through an opening in the diaphragm. This is an anatomical condition, not a disease, okay? So it's an anatomical condition due to that weakness in the diaphragm, and we have like the stomach popping up through the diaphragm, all right? Now, most people display few, if any, symptoms. The major symptom is a gastroesophageal reflux, okay? So that is the major symptom of hiatal hernias is gastroesophageal reflux, pyrosis, okay, heartburn. Make sure you know that heartburn is pyrosis. Um, so they suffer from pyrosis after overeating especially. Complications of strangulation can occur. Infarction can occur, which is tissue death. Because if a, if a portion of the stomach pops up, uh, you know, from where it's anatomically supposed to be, and it pops up because of a weakness in the diaphragm, it can become strangulated, okay, and an infarction can occur, and that means we have tissue death. Um, again, this is very serious, and it requires surgical intervention. Some contributing factors to hiatal hernias include obesity, uh, trauma, uh, weakening of structures due to the aging process, okay. With that being said, make sure you look in your book at your lifespan considerations. It's in a green box. And it says lifespan considerations in the older adult and it's GI disorders, okay? Make sure you read through those, that's important. Okay, so moving on from that, we're going to talk about two different types of hernias that your book gives you a picture of, but it doesn't give you any information about them. So look at the top of the page above your lifespan considerations with your older adult and you see two different types of hiatal hernias. You see A, which is a sliding hernia, and you see B, which is a rolling hernia, okay? Make sure you take notes on this because um, this is something important that you need to remember about these two different types of hernias if you ever hear about them again. So first off, we're gonna talk about a sliding hernia, and you may have to replay this over several times to get the full definition, but the what a sliding hernia is, it is where a part of the stomach, so a sliding hernia is where a part of the stomach protrudes from the abdomen, so a part of the stomach protrudes from the abdomen into the chest cavity, so it's protruding from the abdomen into the chest cavity. It slides into the chest cavity with swallowing and returns to the abdomen after swallowing. Okay, so every time I swallow, okay, that part of my abdomen is gonna slide up into my chest cavity when I swallow. And then it's gonna return down to the abdomen where it's supposed to be after I swallow. So again, a sliding hernia is just where a part of the stomach protrudes from the abdomen into the chest cavity. It slides into the chest cavity with swallowing and returns to the abdomen after swallowing. And that is a sliding hernia. A rolling hernia, okay, that's in figure B there. You can look at the picture there. So a rolling hernia is where part of the stomach protrudes from the abdominal cavity and remains by the side of the esophagus. So it's slid up there and it stays put. So that is a rolling hernia. And again, a rolling hernia is just where a part of the stomach protrudes from the abdominal cavity and remains by the side of the esophagus. 
So part of the stomach protrudes from the abdominal cavity and it remains by the side of the esophagus. So that is what is meant by a sliding hernia versus a rolling hernia. All right, so what, is, what are the medical management things that can uh, be done for my patient who has a hiatal hernia? A, what is called a, you do not have to remember this one in particular, but it is called a posterior uh, gastropexy. And this is where the stomach is just placed back into the abdomen and it's just sutured in place, okay? So it's sutured in place. Um, a laparoscopic procedure, and we've already talked about this one before with our uh, GERD, a Neeson fundoplication is what we're talking about with this. Uh, this can be done, of course, laparoscopically like we've talked about, and it's a Neeson fundoplication. We can have this done for our patients who have hiatal hernias. So again, what is done here? The stomach's fundus is wrapped around the distal part of the esophagus and it's sutured into place, okay? So we just have this, the fundus of the stomach, it's wrapped around the distal part of the esophagus and they suture it into place. And you have a picture of that Neeson fundoplication uh, in a picture right beside of your sliding and rolling hernias that you can look at there. It's showing you what is being done, okay? Um, also, remember I, I included a video on uh, after the GERD information, you had a video there that you could actually watch about a Neeson fundoplication. So if you need to revisit that, that might help you refresh your memory. All right, so what are my nursing interventions for hiatal hernias? Okay, uh, our nursing interventions are gonna be similar to that of anyone who has had a, a gastric surgery. So it's gonna be similar to uh, post gastric surgery interventions because it's gonna depend on the procedure that was performed on the patient. Now these are not in the book, okay? So some of the things that you might consider um, are things like uh, the head of the bed elevated, okay? So we elevate the head of the bed. They did not put these in the book for whatever reason. So elevate the head of the bed. We want to prevent aspiration, weight reduction, smoking cessation, administer antacids per orders to help decrease intra-abdominal pressure. So those are some of the nursing interventions that you might see done after a hiatal hernia procedure. So head of the bed elevated, prevent aspiration, teach about weight reduction, smoking cessation, and then administer antacids per your doctor's orders to help decrease intra-abdominal pressure. So those are some of the nursing interventions uh, that can be done for our patients post-op after a hiatal hernia procedure. Here's an example that I've included for you to look at of an abdominal hernia binder. Uh, we talked about this. It helps to uh, prevent the protrusion of the hernia and it also helps to hold the abdominal contents in place. So this is what an uh, abdominal hernia binder looks like. Here we have an inguinal hernia truss. Um, this is used, uh, it can help patients to feel more comfortable temporarily if they are suffering from an inguinal hernia. So again, this is used for comfort measures, but it doesn't actually treat the hernia, okay? It, this is actually just used temporarily. Um, so this again is what an inguinal hernia truss looks like. 